This is the Mobile Home Park Lawyer Podcast with Fur Neiman. If you're looking to generate wealth and passive income in the lucrative world of mobile home parks, you're in the right place. You'll discover solutions to the common legal and operational pitfalls and how to optimize parks to maximize income. Your host is in the trenches. He's a real estate attorney, financial analyst, and mobile home park investor and operator. Now, let's turn it over to Ferd Neiman. Welcome back, Mobile Home Park Nation. Ferd Neiman here again today with another episode of the Mobile Home Park Lawyer Podcast. Got a a pair of guests for you today. So two for one is going to be extra special for lease communities. We've got Vincent Tao and Elizabeth Woods. Vincent, Elizabeth, thanks for coming on the show. Hi, Ferd. Thanks so much. Yes. Yeah. Well, look forward, look forward to uh, talking to you guys. I know it's been several months since we've seen each other in person. So it was nice to be able to jump back together on the screen here. Why don't you, I know you guys a little bit, what for our group that doesn't, why don't you guys tell us a little more of your background and how you got into MH and then we can go from there. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for again, uh, excited to be on the podcast. Um, I have been listening to first podcast for some time and, um, I've been listening to a lot of podcasts, but I would say that the depths and nuances covered uh, in this podcast are pretty rare, uh, even amongst the other uh, po- fellow podcasts. Uh, but so my name is Vincent Tao. I am an uh, immigrant, uh, came to U.S. about 18 years ago. Uh, my background is in mostly engineering and finance. Before um, I delve into real estate, I worked on the Wall Street for about over a decade, um, but I always knew that I, I have some interest in real estate. And before getting into mobile home parks, I invested in some uh, other type of real estate, uh, like condos, single family houses, and apartments. Um, apartments especially are interesting because it has uh, share a lot of the common attributes as mobile home parks, but also differ in many other ways. Um, we can delve into that a little later. Um, but I would say it is the apartment investment that led me to mobile home parks um, because I remember um, I was having a conversation with some fellow uh, apartment investor and that's the first time I heard about mobile home parks uh, back in January 2019. Uh, this is the first time I heard about it and by February 2019, I actually attended the mobile home park um, boot camp by by Frank Rolf. That was a very enlightening experience, and um, that prompts me to 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 get into this space. Uh, one month later, I actually quit my job, my full time job, um, in uh, in Wall Street, and uh, I started full time in real estate. By July 2019, I purchased my first mobile home park, uh, which is a small. Park 29 lot in uh, Greenview, South Carolina. That deal was a uh, um, great success, um, but you know, COVID hits in 2020 and everything went to a grinding halt. Uh, it took me another uh, 12 months to, to purchase the second park, then um, it started rolling. So right now our company have about 11 parks under our belt across three states. Um, so now let me turn the mic to Elizabeth, my partner. Yeah, um, thanks so much for having us, Ferd, and for all the contributions you made to this space. Um, so I grew up in Kentucky. So of course I'd seen my share of mobile home parks. Um, you know, didn't really think that much about them. Um, and then I am actually a pharmacist by training. So unfortunately, not as translatable as a skill as yourself and Vincent. You know, law and finance. But I've always had an entrepreneurial spirit. So I find myself running independent pharmacies. So I did get, you know, some business background there. Um, And one of which of these pharmacies was actually on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. And that tidbit will be important later. Uh, So keep that in mind. But, you know, I just I wasn't satisfied running somebody else's business. I felt like a hamster on a wheel, like most of us do working for the man. And I just really wanted to find a way to make passive income. To me, real estate always made the most sense. It's just, you know, very concrete Um, my family was in real estate on my dad's side. So I had a little background there. 
And, but I wanted to do something on my own. So I really started researching in the space, listening to podcasts, and I eventually narrowed it down to mobile home parks. Um, And since that day in 2019, when I decided I was going to invest in parks, I have purchased eight parks and a commercial building. Um, And one of these transactions, um, it was two parks and a commercial building. That was my first deal. That's actually gone through the full cycle. You know, the purchase, the diligence, the running, the improving, and then the selling of that park, which was also a huge success. Um, I pretty much, we sold it for over twice what we purchased it for uh, about less than two years later. So, you know, this space is, it's amazing. You know, you got to find the right deal and the right people to work with and that kind of thing. Um, but I'm, I'm very happy. I also quit my job um, in pharmacy and became a full-time real estate investor. Um, and it's important that I was working in Manhattan because during my time in Manhattan, um, the story of Vincent and I meeting is so interesting. And it's just funny how life comes full circle. Um, Vincent hosted a meetup group in Manhattan about mobile home parks where he discussed his first park purchase in Greenville. And I was just so impressed with him because I hadn't bought any parks yet. And so I just really enjoyed hearing his story and learning from him. So I stayed after and we connected and, you know, exchange numbers, kept in contact. Um, And then it just so happened that just after that, Vincent moved to Atlanta. Um, Then I went back to Kentucky for a little while um, where, you know, and then I eventually ended up moving to Augusta, Georgia because of my husband's job. So when I moved, I knew Vincent was in Atlanta and I was like, you know what, I'm just going to reach out to Vincent and see what he's up to. And we sat down, um, you know, had coffee, had a conversation, and he and I have been investing in parks ever since. And you can really scale in this industry, which is something I love. Um, You know, we have some really interesting stories together of purchases we've made. Um, Our first purchase was an 80 lot park, and then we called the owner we saw another park touch that property and it was 40 lots. So, you know, we bought our 80 lot park. We call the owner with the 40 lot park touching it, turn that into an 120 lot park and through cold calling. Then we see that there's another property half a mile up the road and it's 75 lots and 17 single family homes. We cold called and, you know, followed up with the guy, showed up at his door and ended up purchasing that as well. So it's really neat if you're willing to, and Vincent really pushed me on this. If you're really willing to do the cold calling and the, if they don't answer, show up at their door and build that relationship with people. Um, that's how Vincent and I have gotten most of our deals. So um, really enjoy working together. It's, it's just by chance. Uh, it's crazy how life works out, but it's yeah. been really good. No, that's great. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's good that you guys can find a partnership from, you know, two different parts of the world, so to speak, and come together and yeah, partner, you know, add all your supplement, each other, compliment each other, all that. So that's great. And yeah, I mean, I think I, you've hit the nail on the head on finding deals, you know, with, you know, finding off market deals, cold calling, building rapport. It's mm-hmm. harder to scale like that, but it's how you can, you know, if you, if you got to do you like, that's often the way to do it. Right. I mean, it's, it's hard for, yeah. you know, people that are, you know, small, the medium size to compete against the REITs and the big private equity groups on, on market deals. So it's like, mm-hmm. that's where you can make your money is on the buy and you're going to make your money on the buy on the, the deal that is hard to find It's hard to get to the owner. So exactly. That's, exactly. You know, definitely, you know, definitely some, some wisdom in, in that strategy. So, so that's, that's good. Tell us, that's how you told us how you found a couple of your deals. So tell us about operations. You know, Vincent, you mentioned you've got an apartment background. So I'm interested in your, your view on MH versus apartments. And then just in, in general, Elizabeth, I'm curious how you use your, you know, pharmaceutical skills and entrepreneurial skills, you know, to, to supplement the business and just kind of interested in what you guys have learned and how you can, how we can learn from you to improve our, our own operations. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, so, you know, I, I've been investing in uh, apartment for, for um, probably uh, a few years before the, the, the mobile home park. Um, so there's a lot of similarities between the two, uh, given both in the, you know, multifamily space, um, a lot of the apartments we were looking at are in also class 
class B or class C, um, and sometimes they are in the similar area as well. Um, and but you know, there's also a lot of differences, and you know, there's pros and cons between uh, both both asset classes. Um, so I would say the one major difference is that the you know. I, I, I usually uh, draw the comparison between apartments and mobile home park. I would call apartments as, uh, or mobile home park as, you know, standalone apartments. Uh, essentially, especially if you operate a, a park on home model, uh, where basically all of your tenants, you collect rent, you, you, you're responsible for all the maintenance and the repair, uh, you do all the improvements. Um, if you run that model, uh, mobile home park actually will make, um, I would say, on average, a bigger percentage of a profit, uh, just because the repair maintenance is easier uh, when you don't share walls and roofs. Um, so the you know you know if there's a water leak for one unit, uh, you don't have to you don't have to worry about the the water leak going to the downstairs uh, in apartments. And uh, also the you know the, in terms of the 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 code the building code uh, etc. It's it's uh, all, also a lot easier uh, with, with with regard to the lender as well as the insurance company. Insurance company and lender usually have pretty strict requirements um, for for the um, for for the uh, apartments. Uh, but of course, if you're using Fannie Mae. Freddie Mac, then, then there's no difference. Um, the other thing I would say is the in the apartment space, it's very difficult to to do any off market deal. Uh, you know, occasionally you might be able to find uh, like a you know a pocket listing, but it's it's overall it's you know not many people cold call apartment owners because most of these are institution institutional owners anyway, uh, but mobile home park is completely different and there's still a lot of opportunity uh, to, to call the, 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 the mom and pops. And the other main thing um, that, that's different, but I, I also find it pretty intrig intriguing is that the, the unit number or the size of uh, apartments usually is a lot bigger than mobile home parks. And which also kind of justify their their purchase price is it, you know oftentimes um, you know maybe like five times or ten times of apartments in the in the same area uh, ten times of a mobile home park in the same area. Uh, it's not unusual to find uh, you know two hundred unit apartment building or even like four hundred uh, unit apartment building, but it's a much rare. To, to find mobile home park in that size. Uh, you know, a 60 space uh, mobile home park is a decent size, but 60 unit apartment is, is relatively small, uh, you know, in the, in the spectrum of all the available uh, listings. So um, so th that's, that's another reason why the apartment uh, is more uh, geared toward institutional owners, um, but, um, you know, there's also on, on the on the flip side, uh, I would say, you know, apartment uh, investing has has been um, around for a lot longer years. And there's a lot of, you know, training programs or, uh, you know, uh, a lot a lot of more mentors in the space that uh, can guide you through the, the apartment investing. But in mobile home park space uh, I mean there are learning programs but you know besides the the, the boot camp uh, has been there for for quite some time the other programs are pretty new and you know it's not as well structured as um, apartment investing I would say so all in all I just you know if I have to choose one I mean that's what I how I made a choice that um, I I find there's a lot more opportunity in the mobile home park business versus the, the apartments because apartments has been, um, you know, favored by a lot of people and the space has been very crowded. Even though mobile home park 
is getting more competitive, but it's nowhere near the competitiveness in, in the apartments. Mm -hmm. okay. I agree. Yeah, thanks for input there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think too, something I would add, because I also looked at, you know, a bunch of different um, areas in real estate and just, you know, the, the cost of entry, you know, I mean, it just seems incredible to try to buy, you know, a multi, multi-million dollar apartment complex. So that just didn't seem reasonable to me. Um, another reason I chose yeah. parks too, it's easier to scale versus buying single family homes, but you know, it's still attainable for, for all of us. So, you know, I don't want any new people in the space to get discouraged because, you know, we've only been doing it for a few years and it's, it's really incredible what you can accomplish um, in the park space. And, and no, uh, I, I forgot. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry, I, I forgot to add one point that uh, I feel there's a lot more uh, creative strategies in the uh, mobile home park space versus apartments because the apartment you you own the home uh, there's not much you can do in terms of you know sh shifting the, the the ownership of individual units to the to to, to the tenant um, but in in mobile home space you you have many different ways rent to own or tenant own home you can easily infill in units uh, compared to you know building a new apartment building that that's a lot more more work um, so there's just a lot more different ways to, to add value in the, in the park space, I would say. Yeah, no, I think there's definitely, MH is more creative nowadays, I mean, particularly because you have some unsophisticated sellers. So there's just more opportunity for some ground leases or a master lease concept, seller finance. Um, and sometimes there's, you know, you buy the homes and not the land, you buy the land, not the homes. There's other, you know, sub-tenant Lonnie dealers within the parks. And, you know, to Elizabeth's point, you can you can buy a mobile home park at a, you know, the smaller park in particular at a pretty attainable price. And then to Vince's point, you know, part of the reason, you know, I was doing single family and I decided, oh, let's get into apartments. There's economies of scale. And then I got there, I was like, everybody already figured this out. This is really expensive. I can't compete you know, perhaps from sophistication, but certainly from a capitalization with some of these other players for an MH space. It's like, all right, I can kind of hang in this space. And it's like, you know, yeah. this is, this is not, it's not a simple business by any means. I think it's probably more active than the apartment space. It's harder to get third party professional management. So I feel like the vast majority of park owners are also park operators, whereas in the apartment right. space, it's a lesser ratio. Um, you know, that has its own pros and cons, but yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, there's still opportunity in, in both. Um, we do, we yeah. do some apartment yeah. work on the legal side here. I've got investments in some apartments as well, but I think that, you know, from a profitability standpoint, um, there's, there's, there's more unturned stones to be, to be found in the manufactured housing classification than in the multifamily apartment classification. Exactly. Yeah, I agree. Sure. The window of opportunity hasn't closed for parks yet. You know, we were able to just find and we just looked in the small area around where we lived because to your point, you do need to self-manage a lot and you do need to go check on your property because you don't have that professional, you know, management group there. So for us, we looked in the, the smaller area around where we live and we'll expand out. But that's just been much more manageable for us to oversee our properties and our investments. So we are, you know, very involved in that aspect of everything. Um, and that's been really helpful for us. Yeah. I mean, the, the management, I, you know, to, to first point that the management is the key um, in, in the mobile home park business because the, a lot of the, you know, especially for tenant uh, home um, park, uh, where the, the income is, yeah, there's a lot less expense, but the income is also quite limited. So in order to hire a, you know, full-time manager, uh, you know, a lot of times you, you, you can't afford to do that. And then you would have to use a lot of creative ways to, to manage um, virtually or to hire a virtual assistant to, to turn a lot of the, the, the work online. So there's now, not not a need to have an on-site person uh, full time. Uh, that's the only way to to manage some of these parks. Um, 
So yeah, you know, that's what we are kind of uh, exploring in the, in the past couple of months because the one, one issue we found after owning these um, parks is that, you know, we can't, um, we are not able to, to manage uh, to, to the same standard as when we only have one or two parks, uh, which we can dedicate a lot more time to, to individual tenant. But now when you have over 10 parks, then, you know, you have to ha have a lot of other people to help you to, to manage. And, you know, that's, that, that's when we started to really think about how we can um, make the, the system more scalable and to leverage more of other people's time to, to help us manage. And, you know, it, it's still been work in progress, but I, I think uh, with the, 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 the knowledge, you know, the leverage of the technology, the virtual system, um, a good property management software, that makes um, a lot easier to, to manage uh, parks and we're more confident to acquire more uh, when we have this system in place. Yeah. No, I, oh, I think that's a good point. I mean, the, the, you know, Mark, man, mobile home parks give a unique opportunity for management because of the size and because you mentioned top line revenue on a tenant owned home park. It's just, it's not that much, right? So, I mean, I've got a 20 space park in Iowa and it's like, I, don't, I can't afford a full time manager, even a low paid, you know, 25,000 a year full time manager. So that, that park cannot support it. So we go with the park greeter model on that, which is somebody that lives in the park and gets free or reduced lot rent. And this guy doesn't even get fully free. He gets reduced lot rent. He has minimal duties. We have minimal homes come vacant. If they do, we give them commissions for that. We pay him hourly to mow the grass. And, you know, he, he walks around and, you know, gives out trash violations and is a nosy neighbor. And we hear from him once a month. And it's a pretty easy park with high collection, like hundred percent collections and no real problems. Now, if, it if we get more, if we do get more problems or we have challenges with collections or have home, numerous homes go vacant, now we don't have any rental homes there. So that's, okay. we got, we sold them all. So that makes it easier as well. But, right. you know, we don't really need a lot of staff. You know, we probably, mm -hmm. this guy probably works an hour or two a week and then plus mowing four hours a time for a portion of the year. So that's a much different staffing structure than a park where we're going to bring in 25 homes this year and, yeah. you know, put in the concrete, put in the driveways and build the decks and skirt the homes and go through the permit process and sell them with a lender and go through all that paperwork. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there you, you need maintenance and management. Right. And more, you know, headquarters oversight. Exactly. And really reliable people on the ground who can do that stuff for you. Um, in my Illinois parks, we did quite a bit of infilling. Um, really interesting tidbit. And it's a little different everywhere you go, but we got really lucky. Um, we purchased two parks and the smaller one is 26 lots and it was mostly vacant. We had to sell or finance it. Um, and we ended up realizing that a few of the homes sitting there in our park you know, the taxes hadn't been paid on them. So they were tax sale homes. So that's something that I've been really successful with is buying homes in tax sales. It varies, you know, by county and state, but that's been a really neat way for me to do big infilling at low prices, you know, less than a thousand dollars for a home already sitting there. And you don't have to find all the crews to, you know, install it or get it improved, you know, approved newer homes are much, a much bigger animal. Um, so that's something that, um, I found helpful and I encourage people to look into that locally. Cause I know the used home market, you know, with COVID and all the, the newer homes, you know, took you forever to get one and prices were so high. I feel like the used home market is essentially nothing. Um, if you're trying to find them yourself. So, mm -hmm. and then I think for, you kind of asked me how pharmacy relates to, um, mobile home park investing. And I truly hadn't thought about that before, but now that you say it and something else that's really helped us, especially through COVID time is, you know, as a pharmacist, I was responsible for helping people afford or get their medications no matter what. So I did a lot of patient assistance programs and that kind of thing. And something we've been really successful with in South Carolina um, and some other states is the um, assistance program, um, you know, for rent. So something we did, it was a very tedious 
tedious process. So we ended up incentivizing our on-site manager to help with that paperwork by giving her a bonus every time, you know, we got the check from the program there as SC State Plus. So I think that's something that really made sense to me, um, you know, to help people pay their rent, get ahead. You know, the more, more money they have in the pocket, the more money they have to pay you in rent even down the road. So um, that's been something that has helped us a lot. Um, we still made people pay a little bit because we realized if the checks take a while to get there, but, um, you know, it would be thousands of dollars at a time. Yeah. You know? um, yeah. The rental system program has been really helpful to us um, in the, you know, in the, spa- in, the, in the states we're in, Georgia, Alabama, South Carolina. Um, you know, a lot, well, I mean, this year all the funds are running out, but last year, it helped quite a bit of, I would say at least um, 30 to 50 tenants. We, we got them funding wow. through rental assistance. Um, and yeah, so it, it's, it's been really helpful. Um, I, I guess it kind of depending on the state, um, some states are a lot easier to get a funding versus the others. But our model is we, we, we don't file eviction right away. We usually always try to work with the tenant uh, whenever possible, uh, you know, after the fifth of the month, we will usually give them, you know, a notice and try to see if they can give us a day when they can pay. Um, and, and then if they say they can pay, then we try to see if we can, um, you know, point them to rental assistance or uh, set up a payment plan that suits their, uh, you know, their uh, ability to you know, for the income, or um, only when they don't respond, um, then, you know, then we will send them the non-renewal letter. But then, you know, usually two days after non-renewal letter, we want to also give them a cash for key letter um, to see if they want to move out. And usually at that point, they're going to talk to us. And sometimes we can make agreements, sometimes cannot. Uh, if not, then we just go ahead with the, the eviction. But that way, we feel like we, you know, we we know a lot of people were struggling during COVID, and also especially right now the the recession. And there's, you know, uh, more and more people are are lost job, jobs, and so you know we try to try to be aware of the the current uh, you know economic situation and try to help people but at the same time we want to be fair to everyone so the late we, we usually don't waive late fees uh unless we set up a payment plan uh then at that point um if they follow through the payment plan we will waive some late fees but if they miss the payment plan we're going to double their late fees so we want to make it very uh you know you know, make make them aware that they have to follow through their promises in order to to stay in the community. And so far, it's been working well. Uh, our delinquency has come down quite a bit after we adopt that approach. No, that's that's good that it's working. I mean, for for us, we we have a lot of people that use the government programs as well during COVID time. Um, some of the states some are are running out of money. I know, like Illinois, yeah. we own I don't know six or seven parks in Illinois and Illinois is out of money now. And yeah, I, I think these people, I think what the system has done is it's taught these people bad habits that they don't have to pay their bills. We have some people that have not paid rent in 15 months. They fall mm-hmm. behind three months. You know, we've, we've, we file for eviction right away. The court in Illinois is now giving them a court appointed attorney. And then they're mm-hmm. forced to go to mediation. And then at mediation, mm-hmm. they say, we'd like to get on a payment plan with government aid. Okay, government aid shows up, government aid pays it. Three months later, runs out, repeat. Three months later, runs out, repeat. And now the government's out of those funds. So yeah. this guy is probably not going to pay. So it's he's going to live there for 18 months, and then finally the government quit paying. So I do think we're going to come in as an industry, really more as a society, we're going to have a, a major problem coming down the pike where people were taught bad habits and we're seeing, we're seeing home sales right now. People that are making 70,000 a year Mm -hmm. can't get approved for a $50,000 mobile home because during COVID they didn't pay their rent or during COVID 
They got a nice fat stimmy check and they use this down payment to buy a $90,000 souped up truck and their truck payments, 1100 a month. And now they can't, get, <laughs> now they can't get a house despite right. having a nice middle-class job, you know, buying an inexpensive home. So I think to be determined yeah. how this is going to shake out, but uh, I think a lot of these people are going to be at the soup kitchen a year from now with no home, no credit, no money because they got these yeah. habits from all these, these stimmies and everything else. Yeah. That's fresh. Yeah. I mean, I definitely there's a lot of people not going to make it. Um, you know, I, I would say the same thing, but you know, we at least give them, I would say, yeah. I mean, after a couple of months, if they, the money runs out and they start to be delinquent, then, you know, they will still be evicted. Um, but we, we were trying to, you know, every time we tell them the when, when we got the funding, we always send them a letter saying, hey, now you got a couple of months free, um, free, free rent, but here's what you need to do. You need to start saving some money. Uh, you need to try to, you know, be more responsible for, for your finance. And uh, sometimes we even send them some, uh, some, uh, you know, free resources, how to, you know, sort out your finance and things like that. Some people will take the advice, some people don't. And, you know, then after a couple of months, yeah, I mean, if they don't take any advice and they don't sort out their finance, then it, it's really on them. And there's, you know, anyone who can help themselves, no one can help them. So, well, you know, yeah, we have to let them, let them go at that point. Yeah, exactly. Actually, one of our onsite managers is a retired social worker. So she's been able to put together really good guides of, you know, where people can get help. Because even if they get help with, you know, groceries or utilities, then they have more money to pay their rent. So um, that's also been helpful for us through churches or things like that. The people that really need that help. That's, it. that's not, yeah, that's not a bad approach either. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, this is good. What any before we could jump here, any other tips or tricks or stories you want to share? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, one thing I want to touch upon is, you know, in terms of the, you know, I know a lot of people interested in acquisition and uh, yeah. So, you know, Elizabeth already mentioned quite a bit uh, in terms of the, the, um, you know, talking to seller uh, for the, you know, cold calls through the, to, you know, so one thing I want to say is that cold, if if your your target is a park in the in, in the same area you're living, uh, staying, I would say uh, try to yeah try to show your face makes a huge difference. There you know two cases, um, one that you know, deal that was Elizabeth and also another deal, uh, one of my first few deals uh, that we were almost like we were, we were in discussion with the seller for for the park but he has like three buyers offering the same term um for the park and i got the park the only difference is that i show up at his door and he he while well, he was not home and then i drop a note and then after after that he actually called me back he said i don't know i see anyone you know actually show up in my my house and my camera can't capture your, your image. Like, aren't you afraid being, being shot? <laughs> I, I said, I didn't even thought about that. <laughs> but, I am uh, now. <laughs> yes. Uh, but, but yeah, so, but that makes a difference. And then, you know, um, he, yeah, we, we go through that process. That deal probably took, took, took me uh, six months to close. But, um, and then, then we become good friends. Like, uh, whenever I have any issues or any need any help reference on contractor in the area, he is very, you know, he, he always, before, before we close, he probably pick up my phone, um, you know, three out of 10 times. Now he pick up the phone probably nine out of 10 times. <laughs> so I would say. He's got, that, he's got all that free time. He's not managing that park. <laughs> He's looking for I a guess so. you took you took his oh. work so now he's bored. <laughs> yeah. well, he always complained I uh, so so they're too cheap to you. <laughs> but um yeah, but I, I so so you know to to the point that you know when when you cold call you definitely the, the relationship really matters in this business. It's it's really about the person. Um a lot of times when you have the good relationship, the price 
or the term doesn't matter as much. Um, and then the other thing I want to touch up touch upon is in terms of uh, the financing, um, because especially right now the financing are challenging um, for you know to get a bank financing. Um, the rates are pretty high, so a lot of people trying to do the the seller financing um, and the the you know some of the I, I guess some of the the deals we did in the in the past uh, we tried to do you know some combination and wh where you got a you know you you will get a you will have, you you will get the the bank financing cover maybe like seventy five seven to seventy five percent but then you will try to work out another agreement to to get a secondary uh, loan with the the seller and sometimes it could be uh, collateralized on on the property, but sometimes you cannot. Um, so in those cases, uh, we actually try to collateralize on some other properties. Uh, so so in order to get the the secondary lien, um, and you know sometimes we also negotiate with the the lender um, in terms of the the capex budget, and that proves uh, you know very useful when you have. A turnaround park to to do the work, to paving roads, to to you know to trim trees, to to do you know waterline works and things like that. Um, so I would say trying to um, be more creative in terms of financing that will make a huge difference uh, for for the for the financial return. The lending is you know pretty much the the bulk of the money. That that's investing into the property. Yeah, it's definitely more challenging in today's environment with the interest rates the way they are, and you know it's hard to get a quality loan at this moment. For what's your strategy to to for financing um, in the current situation? Well, I mean, deal flow is slowing as a result of interest rates. I mean, we, we could try seller right. finance. That's hard to do. Um, I don't really want to get agency loans right now and lock in mm -hmm. these rates because there's a big prepayment yeah. or yield maintenance penalty. So I think the strategy is, you know, put up a little more equity, get a recourse, recourse local bank loan and hope rates go down in two, three years and then refinance out of it. And in the meantime, you got a, um, you know, a, a local bank loan with a, you know, interest rate that good grief it might be 7% today. Um, certainly not going to be sub six, um, unless it's a big project, but I mean, just for a, for a kind of a small, medium sized deal, you know, 500,000 to a million five, mm -hmm. probably looking at the high sixes right now. Uh, yeah. And maybe seven. So it's hard to buy a deal. That's, you know, a six cap, even, you know, it's right. not going to pencil very easily. You got to put, start putting 35% down instead of 20 or 25, mm -hmm. or you got to buy a deal. that's a nine cap, which is really hard to find. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Well, I hope the the cap rate probably gonna arise with the interest rate in the in the, sh in the short term, and you know, hopefully, twenty twenty four the the rate's gonna. I mean, that that was the the pro forecast to the the rate's gonna drop in twenty twenty four, but um, yeah, I, I you know we are we're kind of in the same boat. We are not in the active acquisition mode right now um, but we feel like there will be um, there might be some motivated seller uh, later this year when if if their loan is about to you know uh, expire or you know they they have personal situation that they have to sell so we are you know hoping there's going to be more deal in the later half of this year yeah, agreed. And then the people we cold call with, you know, we continually follow up with people. So, you know, we have a, you know, a streamline going of of deals and you never know when exactly they're going to work out or pan out or or whatever. But we've actually been pretty successful with seller financing through building those relationships. You know, you trust the person um, and you can get a lot more accomplished, when, you know, when they trust you back. So. Um, that's probably what we'll kind of be aiming for. We went through a loan broker for one of our deals and that was helpful as well. Um, so I would tell people to check into that if they're having issues finding funding. 
Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, loan. I've used loan brokers in the past, and it depends on it's it depends on the deal size and location as to which broker to use and if what, what lenders are ultimately going to find and all of that. But they can certainly they can certainly help. I often will try to get a local lender that's local to that property, or once you get a good relationship with a local lender, they'll follow you around. Um, yeah. you know, even outside of the state, uh, sometimes there's restrictions. I had one time where they would not follow me outside the state because their bank charter didn't really allow it. And they would have to do a bunch of hoops that they were unwilling to. So sometimes you got to ask the bank, I'll do it early on. Like, are you lending in this state or will you lend in this state for this type of asset and get a quick no before I even put together a loan package or anything like that, because you don't want to waste time. Mm-hmm. I had that happen to me one time where I went through the whole process and committee approval and then got, got committee approval. Then I got board approval mm-hmm. and then the CEO vetoed it. He's like, we're not, we're not doing any loans in that state. Our charter is not there. We sometimes make exceptions, but we're not making exceptions this year. You know, so like what? Yeah. So yeah, part of the, that's part of the process, right? Is figuring out who your, your capital partners are from a, whether it's your own capital or you've got right. investors or you've got lenders. Is it the seller or your capital partner in some respects? So yeah, there's lots yeah. of options. You know, be creative out there. Exactly. All right. All right, guys. Well, I appreciate your time. Um, look forward to catching up with you guys more. Till next time. Thanks and God bless. Thank you, Fern. Thank you, Fern. Appreciate it. You've been listening to the Mobile Home Park Lawyer Podcast with Ferd Neiman. Ready to learn more? Go to www.themobilehomelawyer.com for free resources and materials to help you succeed. If you love the podcast, go to Apple Podcasts, give us your review, and subscribe today. Thank you for listening. Neither the Supreme Court of Missouri nor the Missouri Bar reviews nor approves certifying organizations or specialist designations. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely upon advertisements.